Why? Why do people chase hype? In a book called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds, the psychologist Charles McKay tries to explain this phenomenon by suggesting that crowds of people often behave strangely and irrationally. One of the events that convinced McKay of this was something that occurred in 17th century Holland, known as tulip mania. Tulip mania was a speculative price bubble that caused the price of rare tulip flowers to soar to extraordinarily high levels. So high, in fact, that one strain known as the Viceroy tulip became valued at roughly five times the price of the average home during this time period. And if tulip mania doesn't provide the perfect case study for why people are inclined to chase hype, we can use a more modern example. There were people out there who were buying the beanies, and this was their livelihood. The prices were up 350 and up 450 and up $900. During the late 1990s, a craze swept over the world. That craze, known as Beanie Baby Mania, resulted in the price of a standard, mass-produced teddy bear to rise unbelievably high. At the time, the average Beanie Baby retailed for around five pounds. But due to consumer hype and market speculation, the price of these Beanie Babies rose to hundreds, if not thousands of pounds in value. Beanie Babies became such a mass cultural trend that entire books like the Beanie Baby Retirement Guide were written, detailing the most optimal and profitable ways to collect them. And people took these collections incredibly seriously. As we move to the start of 2022, it seems like these days the market for rare or niche collectibles is larger than ever before. A good example of a brand that takes this collectibles approach to their product line but applies it in a completely different way to the previous example is the fashion brand known as Supreme. Supreme have adopted a marketing strategy similar to Apple, which involves creating so much hype around new product launches that massive queues form in front of their stores each and every time they drop a new collection of products. Well, Rick, Pat, we might also add we are live on one of the hippest streets in town. Now, to some people, queuing around the block for a t-shirt or hoodie may seem bizarre. But to Supreme's biggest fans, known as hype beasts, going to notoriously long lengths to express their individuality through collectible fashion is one of the most important things to them in the world. One story that may help you to better understand the motivations of the hype beasts is the tale of the Supreme Brick. In 2016, Supreme made the news and stunned the world when they dropped their new collection. One of the items in this collection was a Supreme branded construction brick, which had a retail price of around £30. To the average consumer, a £30 brick was just not on their 2016 shopping list, but to the high beast and die hard fans of Supreme, they were more than excited to get their hands on the new line of products. So much so that the Supreme brick sold out in record time. The media reports show that shortly after selling out, the brick was being resold in the fan-to-fan -fan aftermarket for upwards of a £1,000 or more. People around the world were shocked. But for the hype beasts that were desperately chasing each and every piece of supreme merchandise they could get their hands on, the brick was more than just a brick. The brick represented raw, crystallised value. To the in crowd, owning a supreme brick said something about who they were as a person. It said something about how they expressed themselves and their unique tastes. It was a signifier that you were in no early enough and you were willing to commit either by queuing up early or paying through the nose to obtain a rare and collectible item. To the outsiders, if the intangible benefits of being a rare supreme brick owner don't appeal to you, there was always the chance of making money. Because a flipper of rare collectibles has always got to be thinking, what's a thousand pounds? People would easily pay three thousand pounds for this. It's a rare collectible. As we've become increasingly more connected online, the things that people have begun to collect have become increasingly more digital in parallel. As the market for digital collectibles becomes more mature, new forms of collectibles are constantly emerging in the market. One new type of digital collectible is called the Non-Fungible Token, or NFT. 
But what is an NFT anyway? The WSW Dictionary defines an NFT as a unique digital stiffer registered in the blockchain. It's used to report ownership of an asset such as an artwork or collector. And in simple terms, it's a chunk of digital data that records who a piece of digital artwork belongs to. But if that doesn't make things clearer, you can imagine what a token might be. But what is non-fungibility all about? Let's go back a step. Alexa, define non-fungible. Non-fungible refers to an asset that cannot be divided, exchanged with other goods, or be easily interchanged with other fungible assets. Do you guys think, both of you, that NFTs will become like really the premier type of art? Will digital art replace art? I think digital art is art. One popular example of a modern NFT is CryptoPunks. CryptoPunks is a project by Lava Labs, which is a series of 1,000 tokenized collectible characters whose proof of ownership is stored on the Ethereum blockchain. CryptoPunks was one of the earliest NFTs in the market to gain widespread success and popularity. And it was due to CryptoPunks that a large number of other projects, including Bored Ape Yacht Club, were inspired to experiment in the crypto art space. At the time of writing, the most expensive CryptoPunk, which is lot 3100, sold for almost $8 million. This price isn't particularly a huge outlier because it's closely followed by the second most popular unit, lot 7804, which sold for around $7.5 million. Combined together, the total historical sales for all CryptoPunks amounts to around $2 billion at the time of writing in early 2022. And if you think that's crazy, I'll counter by suggesting it's not too far off from someone paying several million dollars for a famous piece of art. When someone pays a million dollars for a CryptoPunk or for a Pokemon card, it's just stretching the definition of what art is, and collectibles can get a little weird like that sometimes. In our generation uh, grew up and everything was an NFT, you know, in Call of Duty you're getting the skins, the camouflage, you know, Fortnite, you're, you're changing characters, those are all NFTs if you, if you really think about it. and so. I think for the, the younger generation, it's something that's natural, something that's built in. And sorry, I've never gone to a gallery, but for me, like going on, on Nifty Gateway and like, you know, shopping for art and looking at pieces, that's, that's fun to me. And it's, and it's a cool, fun way to collect art and create value for yourself. If the concept of paying for virtual art may seem like something that's kind of strange and alien to you, some of the youngest users of the internet have been accustomed to the process of collecting digital assets their entire life. The jump between purchasing skins and cosmetic items in games like World of Warcraft is not terribly dissimilar to the processes involved in collecting NFTs. Back in the day, consumers tried to hold on to physical items like commemorative plates, comic books, and rare Beanie Babies in order to speculate on their worth in the future. The time to act is now. In 1978, the earliest Gone with the Wind plate issued at $32, trades at more than 10 times the issue price. To order, call this toll-free number. You risk nothing, so call now. Have your credit card handy. Of course, not all plates go up in value. Some go down, and we can make no guarantee of profit. But in 2022, as we record this video, the collectibles market is going so rapidly that stories of people paying a thousand pounds for a brick, or worse, they're just normal at the moment. They happen all the time. And almost everyone I know these days collects something be it physical collectibles like exclusive trainers or rare music vinyls, or digital collectibles like video game skins, NFTs, and in-game items. But this really got me thinking, what better way to help myself to understand how collectibles work than to go all in and create my own original collection of digital assets? I had a lot of questions, and I was wondering, how could this be a hit? How could I make money from this? How could I up my grind set and take the crypto rocket ship straight to the utopian collectible moon base? using all the skills I've gained hanging out and having a good time on the internet. And then it hit me. Fuck it. We're making an NFT too. That's gotta be the best way for me to answer the question, why do people chase hype? We gotta go deep undercover to discover the hows and whys of the collectibles market and find out exactly how it works from the inside. This series, we're gonna make an NFT and we're gonna give a deep behind the scenes look of exactly what happens. Warehouse. 
In our previous video, we snuck behind enemy lines to give you a sneak peek of the big boy Batman world of cryptographic JPEGs. We said we were going to create an NFT and tell you exactly what happened from start to finish. For those who have been waiting, this isn't going to be that video. But we're going to tell you how it all turned out and give you some insight into the process behind the scenes. Before we proceed, let's take a look at the wider NFT story and see how things have been progressing over the last couple of months. So, since our entrance to the NFT space, it seems like things haven't been looking quite so good for the other projects out there in the world. We've seen an increasing number of headlines in the news with titles such as more than $100 million of NFTs stolen since July 2021. How NFTs went the way of the Beanie Baby. NFT expert imagines a future where poor people serve as real life NPCs in video games. Since the rise of these stories, Public trust in NFTs has absolutely plummeted. And with the value of NFTs falling to their lowest price in decades, this could be a prime time for you to get in on the ground floor of a revolutionary new opportunity. Not financial advice. When the world was locked in their homes during the 2021 global event, why did they go temporarily insane and decide to purchase a bunch of JPEGs en masse? A tough question indeed. But before we get into it, let me try and set the scene a little. A 2016 documentary by British filmmaker Adam Curtis may hold the clues for helping us understand just how humans behave in these sorts of extraordinary circumstances. In his movie called Hypernormalization, he argues that governments, financiers and technological utopians have, ever since the 1970s, given up on the complex real world and decided to build a simpler, fake world in its place. Like in The Matrix, this fake world is very convincing. It looks and feels exactly the same as its authentic counterpart. You can even shake its hand and feel flesh gripping yours. It simply is not there. Just by shifting paper around, these slobs can make 60, 65 million dollars in a single transaction. It's reckless, it's cruel, and it's a disgrace. If you look at your investment, which is, is, is it's not, you can't even buy a watch with that. You must appreciate. The modern world that we live in today has become so hollowed out at its core that people like Curtis believe that it may be intentionally designed to be fake. You know, on purpose. We've seen plenty of pieces of media grapple with the concept of an artificial, simulated world, as well as everyday people's reactions to having to live inside these environments. These narratives help us to explore the idea of a world that may not be as real as it seems. Have you ever had a dream, Neo, that you were so sure was real? But to truly grasp the core ideas connecting all of these works together, we need to take a step back and uncover the source of inspiration for these thought-provoking concepts. What does that mean? It means buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy, because Kansas is going bye-bye. Enter French philosopher and cultural theorist Jean Baudrillard. In 1981, he penned a groundbreaking book titled Simulacra and Simulation. Baudrillard's book dives deep into the relationship between reality, cultural symbols, and society. He says that we live in a world where there is more and more information, and less and less meaning. In today's media landscape, we can put on a VR headset, or load up one of our favorite games and be transported instantly to one of hundreds of vastly detailed, hand-created, simulated worlds. From Red Dead Redemption and RuneScape to Rocket League and Roblox, there's a vast array of completely made up worlds out there that feel real to millions of people every single day. The 
simulated world is like a cosmic mirror reflecting reality. But over time, it starts imitating real world processes and systems and begins to fracture and crack. First we had games that attempted to imitate work. And now, with the rise of work from home software and the gamification of work, we have work that begins to look and feel exactly like games. Those games where you kill each other, and I just, um, I don't, I'm not interested in the game. How about Global Thermal Nuclear War? Which side do you want? Simulacra is a representation of something that either never had an original or has along the way lost its original meaning. Imagine seeing something so often online that you forget what the real thing even looks like. Bangers! Yo! Can I eat the glizzy airy Jaeger left my ass off dancing? Kanye East is a rapper who recently became famous on TikTok and Instagram for looking like and impersonating the real Kanye West. In Baldriard's worldview, Kanye East could be viewed as a simulacrum due to the way this character blurs the lines between reality and hyper-reality on platforms like Instagram and TikTok. In this context, Kanye East represents the hyper-real world where simulations and copies take on a life of their own and can become a separate thing from what they originally set out to copy. As for the copycats, they're a standalone complex resulting from this phenomenon. Nothing but copies without an original. But like I said, it's all speculation. The idea of copies of copies without a real original is a central theme of the anime Ghost in the Shell Standalone Complex. This is a show that explores ideas like simulacra as well as tapping into the very core of the essence behind consumer hype and the rise of NFTs. Imagine a group of unrelated individuals who all start acting in unison, almost as if they're part of a secret society. But in reality, there is no grand plan. It's just a cascade of independent actions that create the illusion of something larger. Copies of copies, with no real way to trace back to the prime mover or original action. Pure simulacra. I bet you never thought about it, but the internet and dreams are similar. They're areas where the repressed conscious mind escapes. A digital artwork by a relatively unknown American artist known as Beeple has sold at Christie's for nearly $70 million. That's 50 million pounds and become the first ever sale by a major auction house of a work that doesn't physically exist. Okay, okay, I get it. You win the explanation, and I'm dropping a bunch of mad statements about how a French guy invented the Matrix, therefore money isn't real. And that's awesome, but what about when the part of our brain that invented money, traffic lights, and say, the alphabet, is used for a slightly more abstract or less practical fashion? 
Assuming simulation theory was entirely true, we could imagine that the collectibles market of the simulated world would become increasingly more absurd, strange, and abstractified as time went on. This process continues to its logical conclusion until people are collecting ethereal concepts such as nodes, or in this case, arbitrary collections of pixels. What if I told you that the people engaged in the abstract simulations of collectibles like NFT, Funko Pops, and Beanie Babies weren't doing so because they were trying to escape reality. They were doing so because they were trying to grasp at something that was real. You have the ability to watch Bitcoin uh, going up, down, and basically this, this process, this roller coaster ride of like, woo, the highs, boom, the lows. And it's available on your phone 24 seven. The value of NFT projects around the world can be highly inflated, and this can be seen in the microcosm of the project that I launched earlier in the year, NFTs. At its height, the NFTs I minted for my practical joke project began trading for around $9 a piece. Things started to really pick up when my friend gave me a couple of beers in exchange for an NFT he wants on a night out. And that seemed like a really good deal to me. And it was at that moment that I realized something was seriously wrong with speculative finance. Were these people insane? During my short time as the Federal Reserve, I realized that there are things people would be willing to speculate on, often incredibly crazy. They might not be based in reality at all. For a while, things were looking real dicey, and around the world, collectors moved in to amass and hoard as much digital gold as their MetaMask wallets could carry. For some of us, we may be sitting in the hangover of NFTs, holding on to our pixels, wondering what the hell we were doing. In this environment, it's much easier to realize why NFTs were able to become so potent in such a short space of time. As the internet becomes increasingly more divided, you've got to ask yourself, are these online tribes and communities people questing for something real and authentic? Or is it just a new form of always-on, hyper-focused, targeted advertising? To me, the NFT Marketing is about values. This is a very complicated world. It's a very noisy world. Those people that are crazy enough to think they can change the world are the ones that actually do. Instantaneous world of electric informational media involves all of us, all at once. I think what I've learned up until the point is the main reason people chase hype is to be part of something, some kind of in-group, community, culture, that accepts them. Whether you identify as a gamer, a flat earther, or a seed or disrespecter, everyone's really doing the same thing. They're consuming digital identity and scoping out their place in one of the many available digital tribes. So, while the whole NFT thing was kind of crazy, and maybe just a little bit gassed up, it was kind of awesome to see this value being created out of thin air, purely off the back of a sense of community, solely powered by the mind energy and processing powers of the audience. That isn't one of the main reasons why the internet is cool. Well, I don't know what to tell you. Roll credits. The uh, Global Village is a world in which uh, you don't necessarily have harmony, you have extreme concern with everybody else's business. When you live out on the frontier, you have no identity, you're a nobody, therefore you get very tough. You have to prove that you are somebody. And so the Global Village is as big as the planet and as small as uh, the village post office. And uh, it uh, doesn't necessarily mean harmony, peace and quiet, but it does mean huge involvement. Uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these are weaponized. This goes back to Clockwork Orange, where he's, you know, has his eyes opened up. Mm. And I think this is the, this is the modern struggle. Then it's, uh, don't be like me. Don't, don't, don't be uh, a 3D or big 